All right. Hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 37 of the Geek Garage podcast. I'm your host, David Dassall, like always. And with me today is my good friend, Ian DePriest. How are you, Ian? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. I'm so excited you're here. I'm so excited for today's topic, which is the Umbrella Academy. Yeah. Um, It is our very first comic book episode or graphic novel episode. I I, I don't... do you think the Umbrella Academy is technically considered a graphic novel or a comic book? I, or, I mean, I, it was released in issues, so I, I don't know if that... I think it's a comic book. I mean, I don't take my word on this because I really don't know the like true definition sure. between the two. Um, but you could always just Google it, ask Webster's Dictionary, right? according to, and, and see for yourself. But I I view it as a comic book because I think it's like a series. A graphic novel, I think more of like Watchmen. Watchmen. It's yeah, like because, a one and done. Right, like, yeah. Almost equated to like a limited series, yeah. like HBO thing. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Which uh, I, I said that in, in no way relation to the HBO I mean, uh, Watchmen that's going on now. For no particular reason. Anyways, God, we're segueing already uh, uh, in tangents. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, like I said, it's uh, I'm, I'm very excited that one, that I finally get to have you on. Yeah, thank and you. And two, that we're finally doing a comic book episode. I feel a tiny bit ashamed that here we are at episode 37 and I have yet to do a comic book episode. But as I've said several times in the podcast before that I didn't really grow up with comic books. I was more of like video games and movies and stuff. So comic books were really ingrained in my upbringing, but I have just recently started to check them out and and start Mm -hmm. reading them. And they have really taken hold. Like I know we, you know, we basically like, you know, we talk every day because we work together. Yeah. And so like, it it seems like every day we're, we're talking about, you know, comic books. Something, uh, some yeah, story. Right. Some... Uh, whether it's, you know, what I'm reading, what you're reading, me getting more suggestions from you, because obviously you have been reading comic books for a lot longer than I have. Mm. So, uh, so yeah, it's it's been a very interesting ride the last uh, year or so, kind of like <laughs> easing my way into it. But anyways, um, let's... Uh, so when we picked the Umbrella Academy, it was kind of random... And there's a, has been a few developments in between us deciding on the Umbrella Academy and today recording yeah. uh, a few things that have happened that have kind of made it a happy accident and a little bit more uh, relevant yeah. to, to put out. Like when we first picked the Umbrella Academy, we were we wanted to do a comic book episode and uh, we finally ended up on this because it was something that you had read Mm -hmm. and you also watched the Netflix series and I only watched the Netflix series Mm -hmm. but I had wanted to check out the graphic novels or comic books and so that gave me the opportunity to read them finally and but it still kind of left us with like yeah it's it's not really like in season it's not something (laughs) that like I they came out like 10 years ago yeah Uh, yeah but then the uh, you had the the idea or um, you, you thought that volume three or the issues for volume three had started coming out and, yeah. it, and it turns out that volume three was just released in yeah. September, I believe. Yeah. And so we were like, cool. Like that's a, a happy accident that that happens. That makes this episode a little bit more relevant yeah. to, uh, to, to releasing it right now. Yeah. I, I was really excited about it. I remember because I remember they were making a show on Netflix of the series and I was very excited to watch it. And then I remember finishing it and I was like, well, now that the show is over, I, I know they still have a little bit more um, story that they, they can use. But I want to know, like, what happens because I've been waiting for a volume three since high school. Right. And I am past that. I am, like, in my mid-twenties, you know, living up my adult life with responsibility. Right. And Just it's like waiting patiently. I've been waiting so patiently. Yeah. And it, I was like, and I looked it up on Amazon. I was like, oh, it's coming out sometime this year. And I was like, oh, maybe, maybe it will. And that kind of forgot about it. And then you found it on Amazon. I was just like, okay, well, we need to read this now. Yeah, yeah. So. And so, like, I, I bought it that day, uh, and I read it the night that I received it in the mail. Yeah. And 
And spoilers. We're going to be talking about spoilers. <sighs> Thank you for that. So, uh, I, I try and drop a spoiler warning if, in every episode where we're talking about content. Yeah. So yes, spoilers for both the comic book and the show because we will... So the the uh, the emphasis will be on the, the comic books. Yeah. Because we want to make this a comic book episode. But we will be bringing up the show in the last third of the episode because we we just wanted like we both really enjoyed the show Mm -hmm. and thought that it's um not in large part but in in several aspects it improved upon the comic books yeah so we just felt it was um worth you know kind of doing a little bit of compare and contrasting yeah so so yeah but the uh, the the final happy accident of this kind of being a more contemporary topic to talk about was my chem getting back together. <laughs> uh, so uh, the we are currently recording this um, Saturday, uh, the uh, November the second, and so it was Thursday, I believe, that my chem made the announcement on so. uh, the internets yeah. that. They are getting back together. And Congratulations! The, yeah, them, for them, yes. Yeah, they. Uh, Joe Jonas was not wrong all along. Uh, <laughs> do you remember that? Like, no, I don't. Several months ago, he he like I think he was on either a talk show or something, and he talked about how he was in the recording studio and My Chemical Romance was recording in the next like room over studio over <laughs> yeah and they uh they thought a lot of people thought that he was just full of shit and i think <laughs> even one or two of the uh members from the bands came out and said no that's that's inaccurate yeah uh, but you know they were just trying to keep a rap on it because apparently they uh, the band has been quote unquote back together for like the better part of a year now yeah and has been either recording or practicing because they have a show this month or, or maybe i think it's in december actually. i don't know uh I'm not sure. it, it's it before the end of the year let's cool. say that um and it, of course it's sold out immediately uh, mm-hmm. i have several friends that are obsessed with the bands and they try to get tickets and uh, are shit out of luck <laughs> because they were super expensive but they also i mean you know it's a band that's been broken up for not a long time, but uh, since... A while. Yeah, like 2011, 2012, something yeah. like that. And and yeah, so them getting back together was something that most fans held out hope for, but did not expect yeah. it to happen. So when it happened, obviously everyone went ape shit. Um, <laughs> I personally am excited. Uh, I, you know, I, I, we were talking a little bit before we hit record that I like the band. I'm not obsessed like yeah. some people, but I, do, I did enjoy most of their albums. Yeah, um, I and- I am not like a super fan uh, of theirs. I was around. I mean, obviously I'm around. I'm still living. Um, <laughs> what? I was. I yeah. You're, you're not like. You're I not phased like- in and out of life. Right. It, it just really depends on my mood. Um, <laughs> but I was. I listened more to Fall Out Boy. I don't know if I'm I, like what the deal was in my life, but I was just like, oh yeah, My Chemical Romance is cool, I guess. And they were there, and I, I knew their hits, and that was my extent of the knowledge. I of feel like romance. My Chem and Fall Out Boy are. Well, I mean, it's it's all alt rock of like the early. Yeah, to, it's a, just whether you want Coke or Pepsi, really. Right. Like, but then, like, Fall Out Boy was a little bit more light mm-hmm. than um, than my chem. Uh, my chem was definitely yeah, more like vanilla Coke. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I don't know. Like, uh, my chem was definitely a little bit more like uh, goth. Dr Pepper. <laughs> Yeah. Why are you trying to equate these bands to? Softers? I made I made an analogy and I'm sticking to it. All right. Um, so yeah, that's uh, uh, like I said, those were all kind of happy accidents with us um, recording this. Like, not not we're not trying to say like, oh, we decided to record this episode back before it was cool. Um, but, I, yeah. I mean, it's... originally when we decided on talking about the umbrella academy like none of this had had happened none of this had happened and we we didn't know that volume three was out yet yeah Uh, so so we just wanted to have a fun time okay guys (laughs) just like love it right like 
Yeah, and so we, we just wanted to put that out as a, a little precursor knowledge for y'all. Uh, not like it's super important, but, you know, whatever. It's, now you know. Yeah. Now, now you, now you have know. Seen and knowledge, knowledge is power. Behind the curtain. Right. We are just men. Right. <laughs> but, you know, continue to ignore the man behind the... Yes. I am from Kansas, so I get to say right. that. Right, yeah. <laughs> was, it, was it the yellow curtain, or was it just the curtain? I think it was just the curtain. Okay. Pretty sure it was just the curtain. Right, and the... Brick road was yellow. The brick road was yellow, according to Elton John as well. Yes, he he said that as he well. He said that he wrote a song about Goodbye, it. Yellow brick road. Nailed it. Uh, I <laughs> I cannot one up Sir Elton John. Even, Not many can truly. Uh, even on my on my best day. Yeah. Uh, which, yeah, it's uh, okay. You have many other talents. Right, yes, I do. Podcasting is not one of them. I do this <laughs> mediocrely, uh, if mediocre. This is great. Word, but, this is uh, a fun time. Yes, so. and we're only on like minute 12, so... Let's go. Right. Uh, you want to dive into the meat of the... I the, do love meat. Right. Well, I am also a fan of meat, um, so let's, let's get cooking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so we initially decided to talk about, uh, uh, like I said, the... Um, the comic books before we dive into you know the Netflix show and before we uh, realized that there was a volume three we're just going to do one and two but then we roped three into that yeah so is there any is there anything that you want to talk about first Uh, is there like initial thoughts that you'd like to kind of get out there initial thoughts um the very first thought that I have personally is just like, who's your favorite character? I feel like a lot of people like to talk about their favorite characters in like comic books or just in general. Right, makes sense. Uh, in any TV show. I um, mean, it's, you know, a, one of the driving forces behind a, yeah. a piece of artwork. I I have always loved um, Allison in, in Umbrella Academy. She She's my favorite um, for a few reasons. Uh, one, her powers are freaking awesome. Mm-hmm. Like... I I love how ridiculous um, her power is. Literally, she can just make shit up and it becomes reality. As right. long as she says, like, I heard a rumor. Or even she unconsciously lies and then somehow manifests hmm. it into a reality yeah. without her knowing. And um, I love that a good um, redemption arc. I like that when we first see her character, she's like... I've done kind of some terrible things in my life and I'm not very proud of them and I'm trying to be a better person so I'm not going to use my powers anymore because I've seen how bad they can be and how selfish I was and blah 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 and I love a good strong female character redemption arc person right I I thought that worked really well with it picking back up in volume two with her like basically taking care of Anya Mm -hmm. Uh, I I thought that was really sweet and obviously we don't know what's what's going to happen in the show uh, and obviously we're not there yet in, yeah in the episode but yeah we uh, i did i, I thought that was kind of sweet in in uh, where it picks up in volume two yeah and i and i feel one more thing like for her i feel like her character may possibly have the most like i don't know internal conflict in some sort of way sometimes like a lot of the other the the other characters like um uh i think was it Arthur is number one. I can't remember. So they have so many names. They have code names and they have yeah. Uh, name it's names. the most confusing in the graphic novel or comic book because uh, they have like three names. They like literally have three it's names. It's the number. Uh, it's ha- their like character name and then their actual their name. Code. Yeah. So, yeah. So number one is number one space or space boy. Yeah. Uh, and his but his human Christian name is yeah. Luther. Luther. Okay, I was yes. close. Luther or Arthur. It was Luther. right. It's one of those old school names. And then number two um, is the Kraken. Is or, the Kraken uh, Diego. Diego? Yeah. And then number three, three is, is the rumor, rumor or Allison, Allison, who's my favorite. Right. Four seance, who is Klaus. Right. Five, which is five, he, doesn't get crazy names. He's just right, number five. Right. He's just number five. We don't know his other names. The, his nemeses refer to him as "Where's the boy? Yeah. We're looking for the boy. Give us the boy." Uh, but yeah, he's mostly just known as number five. Yeah. 
And then six, uh, the deceased is uh, the horror. Poor or Ben. Ben, yes. Sorry. Uh, the Asian. <laughs> um, well, I guess we well, really don't know his nationality. In, in the comics, is kind of like covered up. He has like right. a mask on. He's also dead and not in it for the most part. Yeah. Um, Nationalities don't really take precedence in the comics. No, comic which we will get into why um, later, I guess, or we can do it right now. Uh, uh, we, I mean... Yeah, let's let's earmark that for later when we get into <laughs> okay. comparing more to the the show because I you definitely have more info on that than I do. Sure, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so so yeah, and, and then of course number seven, who is Vanya, or also the the white violin. The white violin. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. Um, yeah, I just love her her character just because Allison, the rumor number three. Um, Break of Chains, uh, not really. <laughs> mother, mother of Dragons, <laughs> Mother of Dragons, uh, Breaker of Voices. Um, she, she, I feel like has a lot of internal things of an internal battle of like what she's done, trying to make up for the mistakes, and also how to move forward with it. And that she really has to be careful with the choices that she makes because her words are so powerful right. that if she says the wrong thing, it goes haywire or if she chooses to do something. Mm-hmm. But also at the same time, there's this kind of like sinister, darker side of her that she kind of like dabbles in a little bit here and there. Like sure. she'll let slip because she can. Um, and so that's why I like her, I think, the most because uh, Luther is very like straight, um, clean cut boy by the rules, by the book. Mm-hmm. Diego is just like mad all the time. Right. He he's very angsty. Yeah, Diego is just like I'm a sad pirate boy. Um Yeah, angry. he tries to come off as like a a badass and and I mean he is, he is. but he's he's very just angsty and, and and mad all the time. Yeah. And then um you have uh uh who's number 4 again? Uh, number four. Was, I lose track of these uh, numbers. That's, the, uh, that's seance. seance so the, seance, Klaus. Klaus. He's kind of very just eclectic. He's just like I'm on drugs. Right. And I'm like I'm a crazy person that's on drugs, and I I'm like promiscuous, and I'm edgy, and look at my pale skin and gothicness. I talk to ghosts. I'm anti cool. Um, and yeah. then number five is just like I'm a hardened criminal. <laughs> <laughs> right. I I am like a ninety year old hardened. Uh, uh, assassin, assassin dude. trapped in like a 10 year old body yeah which is slightly amusing actually and then Vanya is just like I'm sad and depressed um, yes with the the most uh, uh, un um, uh, undeveloped storyline yeah or character arc. yeah which we'll get into later but I think not to for right demean, now demean yeah for right now yes not to demean the other characters I just for me, for some reason, just really love Allison. No, I, um, I get it. Because of that, like, internal pull and push uh, that she has within herself. And I'm sure, I mean, all the other characters do, too, at some point, to have that. But for the most part, when they're first introduced, it's very much like, this is who I am, these are my core beliefs, and I'm, like, this, kind, this is the tone I set. Sure. Whereas Allison is like, here I am. I'm a little bit complicated. I'm trying to just deal with life and be an adult. And like, can we just like get along, please? Mm-hmm. Or like, can we get this together? And I just relate to that uh, a lot. Um, but anyways, we can start at the beginning and like summarize kind of what Umbrella Academy is. If people don't know. Sure. I don't know. If people know. I mean, uh, sure. Uh, or I don't know. You take over. It is your podcast. <laughs> well, I mean, like. <laughs> This is one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on and have you on for this topic was because, like, I just started reading, like, two weeks ago, and you have been reading these I since mean, they've been out. Yeah, uh, but... For the most part. I've, I've read them, and I've reread them, and I and I love them. Um, but yeah. Umbrella Academy, if, for those who do not know, it's a comic book series in three volumes. Um, and the world is kind of crazy. The world is this like whimsical, not whimsical is not the right word. Fantastical maybe? Yeah, I, th- I think fantastical um, is the right word. Like alternate reality to Earth because you have like sentient monkeys, intelligent monkeys right. walking around talking and having jobs. Um, you have uh, like kids with superpowers. It just opens, it starts out literally with a giant squid wrestling with a, a man right. in like a WWE style format. Yeah. 
and that's like the TV show that people were watching. Like, and then it opens into oh, there's an alien person that's disguised as a human that uh, is a g- genius level scientist apparently and has a weird monocle that can see through everything <laughs> right. and tell the truth of what things are and in that instant where the giant squid lost to the wrestler um <laughs> what 40 something kids were born For- to women who were not pregnant at all right. and he and this alien scientist was just like i'm gonna collect these babies because i can and he only found seven of them which uh, forms the umbrella academy Mm -hmm. and each of them have superpowers and he tells the world this he's like i found them and they're like why and he's like because they're going to save the world and then they're like oh for what from what not for what Mm -hmm. uh pourquoi uh so so was it in 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 the comic book canon was it uh as far as like seven out of the the forty something odd um, kids that were born to non pregnant mothers, was it um, was it confirmed that the the other uh, that that weren't part of the seven that they all died, or, it wasn't, or is, is it just implied that he was only to, able to find seven? It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't stated that they all died. It just implied. It just said that he could only find seven okay. of the forty something. Okay, that's they were I'm like talking. they don't know what happened to the rest of them. They were either missing or they were gone. He just could. He only found seven. Sure. Um, and so. Uh, yeah, it opens like that, and he trains these kids, and then they grow up to be 10-year-olds that takes down the Eiffel Tower, which is apparently a spaceship that Gustav Eiffel made, and he's still a zombie. Right. Like, it's just a very, like... Very the most over-the-top, campy thing. Yeah, yeah. the most comic book thing you can do. Right, and, and uh, like, it, me being someone that hasn't been an avid reader of comic books... It was weird to choose this as one of my first because I, I mean, it was like just from the get go, like super over the top. Mm -hmm. And it took a minute for me to, for my palate to adjust Mm -hmm. because I was like, I was trying to figure out like, is this, is this real life? Like, is this actually happening? Like, this is like kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But the, uh, by the time I got to um, Hotel Oblivion volume three, I, I feel like I I met this equilibrium with the the over the topness where I either like leveled out or you know I, I kind of got used to it either way like you know I, I I it went from one of those things where I was like this is kind of weird not necessarily like I didn't like it but it was just kind of weird to I really like it mm-hmm. and I I like this is one of the reasons why I like this series so much is because it's you know kind of campy yeah and I think. The beautiful thing about this series and why I really like it is just that at the heart of it, it's not really about the camp. It's not really about the powers and the people. It's about the people, right. their struggles, right. and family. Yeah, And that's what I've always loved. I, I love that this the way they're looking through and life is through this lens of a ridiculous like fantasy world mm-hmm. where apes... Our literal like co-workers that right. are, are policemen and you have like teleportation devices and you have just super powered humans and giant squids that are apparently wrestlers like <laughs> you know yeah i i love that it's just like yes accept the world now we get to actually talk about the people in it and so it's not as distracting i think when somebody's shooting a laser beam it's not like oh my gosh like how it doesn't take you out of it as much or like make sure it's not as like awe-inspiring in some ways because you're like of course of course this person can fly of course there's a zombie gustav eiffel that made the eiffel tower a spaceship (laughs) like I accept all these things, but now what I really care about is like how how these children have been affected by a really terrible father. Sure, you know. Yeah, yeah, that that totally makes sense. I, um, yeah, I, 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 I had something that I was gonna add there, but I mean that was ve- uh, very well put. Oh, thank you. Um, I, uh, so you you kind of talked about your uh, one of your favorite characters. I uh, from volume one and two. I really liked number one and um, 
who uh, Luther, and then number number five. Mm-hmm. Though they were kind of my favorites. I think at least for volume three, Hotel Oblivion, mm-hmm. uh, Klaus is mm. uh, my favorite. Um, I yes, sorry for for some reason. Like I always say, Klaus. And then I, I think I'm talking about Diego. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're really nothing alike. No, they are not. Uh, but for some reason, I, I guess, uh, I don't know, I, I always get them confused. Either way, um, I just, like, I, I can relate to him a little bit in Hotel Oblivion, not to the extent of being a um, super drug-addicted um, delinquent, mm-hmm. but I don't, like, I, I just, I feel like I can relate to... Um, a little bit of just his struggle in general, mm-hmm. and uh, plus I just find him a, a very dynamic uh, character. And and even though there's only three volumes, you still are able to use your your imagination to to build this idea of who Klaus is, mm-hmm. and. I, I think that's very good work on Gerard Way's part um, and, you know, just whoever was involved, whoever else was involved in the writing. I don't know if it was just him or not, but mm-hmm. either way, um, I, yeah, I just, I like him as a character. I, I think he's a lot of fun. Of course, he's, you know, he was probably the fan favorite in, in the Netflix show. Yeah. Um, but... Um, you know, well, like I said, we'll get to that. Yeah. But yeah, in, in the graphic novels, I don't know if I have one favorite character out of the, the three volumes that we have so far, mm-hmm. but out of one and two, you know, it's it's number one and number five. And then for sure, yeah, Klaus in uh, in, in Hotel Oblivion. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, um, let's see. Let's see. What else? What else do we have here? I uh, you want to talk about the artwork? The artwork. Okay, artwork also is very important in comic books, obviously, because it's both visual and dialogue, right. and it tells a lot of the story. And um, that's one of the other reasons why I love Umbrella Academy so much, the way the art is presented. Mm-hmm. I just, I don't know, I'm not a, I don't know how to dissect visual art very well. I would, I, I never learned, yeah. but... There's something about we can we can all, we can just gush about it and sure like it's just so I don't know the the way um, they're drawn the way the ideas of certain characters come about um, like I said it's like kind of can't be over top ridiculous but it feels really I don't know slick and also kind of cool and also kind of out there mm-hmm. um, it doesn't feel too. I don't know, rounded, if that makes any sense. Like, sure. it doesn't, it's not like, here I am, the Avengers, was so clean cut and round and like, yeah. almost like um, trying to look as natural to real life as possible. This one definitely is like, no, like, my body is literally a white violin. Right. So you're going to accept it. <laughs> um, like, I literally have purple hair. And like, whether I do dye jobs or not, it's just growing out of my head as a baby. Mm-hmm. Like, and I have monkey arms. And I have and monkey arms and a torso. Right. And I'm super hairy. And, Deal with it. Like, yeah, it's just like. And silver hair. And silver hair. It's just. It pops. I think it pops really well. Um, I just like the the details that go into it, especially in the Apocalypse Suite. Um, I like near the end where she is like playing um, the destruction of the Earth, mm-hmm. and there. I love how they incorporate literally the title Apocalypse Suite in the notes of of the staff. Oh yeah, like when she's playing the staff and they're like putting out the notes, and you can see it in there or. Um, yeah, just the way everything is is uh, portrayed. Uh, it also feels a l- like almost like a movie at times. Like I, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, with, you know, f- pictures, moving pictures. That's how right. it happens. But uh, I like the way they cut to things. Like the way they make you wait for a certain thing, and then you turn the page, and then it's like a big, like panoramic right. pull out into like this is the title of this issue. The flow, yeah, of uh, the the graphic images, yeah, is is very well done. Yeah, I I feel like the just the 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 illustration in general, it only gets better over time. Like the apocalypse suite was was 
pretty good. I uh, I thought it was pretty good in, in that. I thought it was a lot better in Dallas. And then the illustration in Hotel Oblivion just fucking blew me oh, away. Oh, yeah. Like, the, it was ty- the space travel? Beautiful. Into, like, after space? What a trip. Right. Literally. Like, like I'm <laughs> chills right now. Like, literal chills. Like, oh, my God. It's so... It's so crazy i love the spectrum of color that they use like it was just like red yellow orange neon and pink at the same time it's like you're looking through like a prism yeah like exactly how intergalactic space travel should look yeah uh, or or what you'd expect it to look like it's literally like rainbow road on the mario kart (laughs) exactly yeah uh one one of the things that i spent the most time just fucking staring at was when um it, it was right at the beginning of Klaus's arc in in Hotel Oblivion mm-hmm. where um he's he's part of the biker gang where they uh, they're paying him <laughs> to uh to you know read the the um or go to talk, talk to, to the, the dead. dead people yeah. of these people and you know you really only see one particular interaction and it's this you know woman who has a dead husband and I don't know if it implies that they're like sleeping together. It's really just like one one panel or like a half page. Yeah. But they're they're getting busy in some form or fashion. Yeah. And there's just this big green thing like yeah, it's... right behind them. Mm-hmm. And like I just spent five, six, seven minutes staring at this. I was just trying to like pick out all the little details yeah. because it's so like um I was just so detailed. Yeah, the pages uh, are filled with the small little things everywhere. Um, it's it's so crazy. Like I know what you're talking about. It's like him with this woman, and um, because he's channeling the the ghost of her dead husband, right? Who apparently like still wants to sleep with her, and is like she's trying to find out where he buried the money that he kept from her, right? And like. Um, the fact that he has candles around him and is performing a seance, it's just mm-hmm. his code name. Yes. And just the green smoke behind him. I love that they portray like the afterlife for him in that kind of way because it kind of mirrors um, like he's high on drugs all the time. Right. Um, and so I like that it kind of interweaves that with him too. It's like, is he like actually on drugs that's why everything is like all green or is this like spiritual or it's a little bit of both and it's like all it's all smoky and you can't tell like what he's seeing and what these spirit or smoke is supposed to be right yeah uh no i like i said that was one of the reasons why i liked klaus so much in in volume three was because of the illustration that went into his his particular arc because he spends a good amount of time by himself yeah uh away from the other uh other members of the umbrella academy yeah which i thought was kind of interesting mm-hmm. like all the other members they they kind of team up in some form or fashion um but yeah you you kind of see him off doing his own thing for a little bit and i but yeah just in general i thought in hotel oblivion the they just pumped out the the or jacked up the the level of yeah illustration um as far as quality goes Mm -hmm. which makes sense because they had a little bit more time to work on this yeah you know we were talking about this again uh off air that you know they they did uh volume one and two pretty much back to back for the most part and then there's a 10 year gap and they were like volume three is coming and i'm like okay cool i'll wait and then like two years pass i'm like where's volume three and they were like it's coming and i'm like okay i'm gonna wait five years pass it's i'm like i've given up hope i didn't think it was coming and i was like i guess i'm gonna watch game of thrones now and we all saw how that had it ended but then i was like i guess i'm not gonna have my happy endings anyways and then they made it into a show and they're like guess what volume three is actually here and i was like yeah oh thank you yeah i was curious to see it, uh, or find out if it's possible to find out if Um, those two things are related Mm. Uh, of them deciding to make a season two is related in any way to them finally coming out with a volume three i'm inclined to say no that they're not related that is just coincidental Mm -hmm. because 
uh, I was told, one of my good friends, Miranda, she gave me, uh, I've, I've talked about her a couple times on the podcast. She runs the YouTube channel Go Nerds. So that's kind of my first plug. I'll have a couple later on. Plug um, it in. But plug she, it in. yes. <laughs> plug it in, plug it in. <laughs> um, she, she gave me a couple of good talking points. Uh, but yeah, go, go follow them on YouTube. It's Go Nerds. Uh, she she told me that she met Gerard several years ago and said, "Hey fucker, uh, where's <laughs> Volume Three, bitch?" Because she at that point in time she had met all the members of My Chem mm-hmm. and uh, like several times, mm-hmm. um, both like in official capacity and like guerrilla style, like mm-hmm. just stalking their band. Wonderful. Um, and yes, and she, so she felt like she was on that level where she could be like, "Hey, bitch." Where's uh yeah? Where, where's my? I've been waiting new, for. Where's my new pages? Yeah, eight and, years. Yeah, and so apparently, like Gabriel Ba. Or, I think that's how you say his name. I do not know. Yes. Uh, I I I'm not. I would say because with, the letter literal last name is B A, but I'm right. Who knows Ba? Ba. I don't. E- I can't even think of any other way to pronounce it. Yes. Uh, sorry in advance if that's not correct. Um, but. So there's an accent on it. So right, yeah, that's that's why I was like, I, I don't know. Um, but either way, uh, she said that he was incredibly busy and that they basically had the material to write volume three. Is just a matter of waiting until Gabriel was available to illustrate it for him, and so they were just stuck in this limbo waiting game hmm. period where you know they had to wait for the stars to align which happens with collaborations because yeah. you know people have side projects and yeah. other things they have professional lives and yeah. sometimes things just take a while so and plus like with such a like going back to the artwork with such a unique and specific style to this artwork right it's if he chose another illustrator it wouldn't feel the same even if the dialogue was right. the same and the plot was the same and the action was the same it would look different and people would rage and burn it in a fire. You, you know? You're speaking in a sense of like if Gerard chose a different illustrator for yeah. Volume 3 to get it out yeah. there quicker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and, I agree. And plus, I don't even know how contracts work for like comic books. So maybe he didn't even have a choice. Sure. Maybe he signed something that like they had to do it together. But Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't look into the politics of, of that side. Yeah. I just, I figured that it was that kind of relationship where, you know, he did volumes one and two, they, or they did them together and it wouldn't feel right to, you know, go and do yeah. the, the third volume yeah. or any subsequent volumes and issues with someone else. Um, and plus, like you said, it would kind of break up the continuity of things. Yeah. And I, I mean, comic books, again, it's both a visual and like literal, mm-hmm. like element. I, think i said that right not sure not the smartest person in the room yeah but uh well you're both you're dialogue across from me so <laughs> by default that makes you the smartest wonderful person i will room. take the lead and just say like I'll, at the end of the day dialogue and visual really matter in comic books like for sure 100 percent. yeah you can't have one without the other yeah same as film really i think that's why they're so similar in, in feel right um um what about uh like the uh the um the 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 dark humor and like black humor behind the like the story and the like the weird dark banter between characters like did, did it come across to you as a little bit on the dark side uh because it did for me like i know we talked about the the story kind of being fantastical mm-hmm. but like the banter between uh, especially the um the the members of the umbrella academy mm-hmm. it seems very dark because they had this very complicated upbringing yeah. by <clears throat> you know a dad that wasn't very loving that he a dad that wasn't really a dad right he was he, just like you are it's kind of like a drill instructor yeah he was like i'm an alien i saved you not really saved you i I somehow I, took you from right, your mother's right. or just I, like I paid for you and yeah and now I'm going to make you a superhero superhero team right and you don't please don't call me dad he literally tells them not oh, to yeah. call him dad so it's just like these poor children who are humans and have superpowers like of course they have childhood trauma and um, going back to what you were saying about it being dark 
I definitely got that. And maybe I think that's another reason why I probably liked it because I do like darker themed things. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that it it goes, it digs a little bit deeper into all of that. And I think that's why a lot of us relate to it or like it is because, um, I don't know, we had all of us go through dark things in our lives, whether it's through mm-hmm. family um, or through personal relationships with each other and we all get it we all can understand it maybe not to the extent of like my father we have an was, alien father we, or like my father was abusive to us right but uh maybe to the extent of like yeah i my family kind of sucks or like there are parts of me that i don't like or there are parts of me that are kind of you know dark and selfish you know right and we get that we get that where these people come from and how now being adults trying to find the balance of like how do i be a responsible person and like you know live my life with all this baggage that follows me around right um and going on with the dark humor <laughs> i it's i think it's blatantly there even in like umbrella academy the the very first one apocalypse suite like there are moments where like assassins show up or like uh, the rumor as a child as a 10 year old child her entire like left arm is missing because of a villain that like ate it like Mm -hmm. he like needed to eat energy or like that's how he lived and sustained himself I think his name was like Terminal Mr. Terminal or Dr. Terminal yeah yeah and he has this like little like circular belt thing on that he keeps on him that just eats atoms or whatever and and, and anything in sight because of his terminal illness right hence the name and she's strapped to a chair and gagged and bleeding because her left arm is missing right and so obviously like it (coughs) doesn't shy away from like anything dark like um even later like the dark humor and i think was it probably in dallas where the time assassins you know cha-cha and hazel right were trying to chase down um number five yeah and yeah i that was probably my favorite part of number five uh or, or uh, number five uh um uh, of dallas yeah was cha-cha and hazel uh i mean they were they were great in the show um, and I know we're not there yet. I sorry. Um, <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, but I, uh, I just I had in my mind like the the ratio of time that they were involved in the storyline in the comic books versus the show mm-hmm. is vastly different. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, that just kind of came to my mind. That's fine. And, um, and it just kind of came out of my mouth. Um, Love it. I don't have control of anything. Love it. Um, but yeah, the, I I loved their involvement in the story. It was, like I said, pretty, relatively brief. But it was like the darkness. The the dark they were the dark got, humor, <laughs> right? It got turned up to eleven. Yeah, with the knob ripped off. Yeah, right, with them involved because they, you know, like when the the chef at the diner or the donut shop. I can't remember if it's a diner in the comic book or a donut shop I think still. It might be a diner. But either way, like, you know, the they're complimenting them on the pie and uh, or pie or donuts whatever. Yeah. And uh, the dude uh, the chef pops his head out and he's like, a "Guy came from Australia trying to find the recipe." And I said, "You're going to have to take my uh arms and legs to to get the recipe and they're like uh yeah and and they proceed to do just and cut to next page literally his arms and legs are gone right yeah he's just a stump um and and how he's still alive i don't know but he manages to whisper i use canned apples (laughs) and i was just like this is so sad but also why am i like kind of laughing also he's dying and these terrible people just literally took his arms and legs because they took a metaphor and made it literal. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I liked their involvement in the storyline. Uh, however brief it was, um, I, I did like how they, how they met their demise basically with, with seance coming back to life yeah, and then ending their lives through possession. Yes. Yeah. That, that's essentially what happened. Yeah. Um, it was it was a very uh, little complicated spurts in in the storyline, but yeah. yeah, that's basically what happened. Somehow I was able to wrap my head around it because anything with time travel involved, 
um, or possession, I immediately get so fucking confused that I'm like, <laughs> someone figure this out for me time and then travel... relay it in, in layman's terms. Yeah, I mean, time travel is tricky. Time travel is a very, very tricky thing to do in writing. Yeah. like Because it, it could go real bad real quick if you don't keep track of it. And if you're in Doctor Who, you just say it's timey, wimey, wibbly, wobbly, and then say that's it. You don't right. explain it. Yeah. You know? Uh, not to shit on Doctor Who. I love Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> no, but sometimes I, it does get a little confusing, and they literally are just like, it's timey, wimey. And I'm like, but right. that's not a reason. But okay, I guess I accept it. I, I, I um, think that's just uh, British humor for you. Yeah. They're like, it's it's like this because reasons. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, cool. Moving cool. on. I guess we're just right. going to ignore it. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I like I said, I, I liked their um, their little thing. Um, do uh, let's see, we we kind of talked, we've talked a lot about the things that we liked. Do do we want to get into the the flip side of that? Some of the sure. things that we didn't like, or room areas for improvement? Um, because I sure uh, like. So, looking at this at, at more of a whole, like volume one, two, and three, mm-hmm. I have less of uh, I have less problems now than I did back when I was aware that there was just volumes one and two, mm-hmm. um, because it left me wanting more. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like the story was kind of incomplete, and I knew that, like you know, it, it's most likely an ongoing series, so mm-hmm. the storyline uh, and the um, the history and what you know about this family will mm-hmm. naturally evolve and unfold mm-hmm. over time as more issues and volumes are written. Mm-hmm. But I still felt like it was a little bit lacking, and mm-hmm. I I don't know, like I, I just uh, like Dallas was you know, like I said, uh, you know, to you earlier. I I thought that it was it was definitely better. Um, but just kind of as a whole, uh, you know, certain parts of the story, I was like, eh. And then um, I thought, I think my biggest gripe was with Vanya. Mm. Like, I, it was a little bit better into, and vastly better in Hotel Oblivion, mm-hmm. her, her, mm-hmm. her part of the storyline. Mm-hmm. But in one, like, I did not feel bad for her at all. Mm-hmm. Uh of course, we'll you know we'll get to the show and you know how uh, you you're made to feel bad for her mm-hmm. in the show, but it just kind of just like with a lot of other elements uh, involved with you know these characters and the story, it just kind of jumps right in, mm-hmm. and so it does make sense to just jump right in with expecting you to with this very li- limited amount of information that yeah. she was told she's not special and you need to feel bad for her. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I didn't feel bad for her. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if they, they were trying to tell me that I should feel bad. I think the I mean, or, or uh, maybe try and be sympathetic for a second until she goes nutso and she turns and uh, she gets turned into the white violin. I think they were like what you were saying. They were trying. They were trying to get you to understand her side as quick as possible. Um, right. But it's hard to do that. Um, in six issues. In six issues, especially when you're brand new as a, a comic book. I mean, you can, but um, so they tried to do it in the fastest possible way of being like, hey, um, she, as a child, was never allowed to play with her siblings or interact with them mm-hmm. because she doesn't have any powers, or so we thought. Right. And her father constantly reminds her that she is worth nothing and only should play the <laughs> violin. Yeah. Um, and so... Like, I feel as children who feel like outsiders, like, that's where we kind of were supposed to draw the connection with. Sure. Of being like, oh, I understand what it's like to be not special and an outsider and not allowed into the group of whatever, like, family, social, whether it's, like, uh, blood-related or not. Right. Or whether it's friends or not. Like, I know, know what it's like to be on the outside and rejected. Mm-hmm. So that's essentially what Vanya is supposed to represent. They'll reject the reject. She literally wrote a whole entire book about her family about being the reject. Right. And like shat all over them in that book. And they hate her for it too. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like that was like basically all the depth that they gave her. I think uh, what you're alluding to or talking about um, that you didn't like is the fact that um, 
I don't know. In, in Vanya's case, or the story in the first uh, volume, Apocalypse Suite, the villain is kind of just very flat. It was your standard, like, I'm a bad guy. I want to destroy the world. I have found my instrument, pun intended, to right. literally destroy the world. And it's going to be a member of the Umbrella Academy. And how he got the notes of this alien like our, from her father saying like oh she's the most powerful one of the seven right and he's just been keeping her unlocked because he doesn't want her to go crazy mm-hmm. um we don't know that it was never explained he was just like i found your dad's notes and now i'm going <laughs> to like experiment on you and now you're gonna be crazy right and like we as an audience is like i guess sure <laughs> like we don't understand any of the science and we're not supposed to because it doesn't matter in this case in this in the series i feel like science never really is explained much sure in this one they're just like there are machines they time travel there are things that aren't working you know because right. science and you're yeah. like of course um and so yeah i think that was what was probably not my favorite part of the the comics as well as the lack of like um depth in the first volume for like you know the villains and sure. some of the characters. And I think that's probably what you were sensing and reading to. Yeah. Um, to, uh, pretty much, but like to play devil's advocate to my own complaints. Got it. Cool. I, <laughs> uh, to, I wanted to throw this out there and, and I just, uh, I, it might be in my notes. It just throw doesn't it. matter. <laughs> um, I, cause I wanted to get to it and I just thought of it. Yeah. Um, very, uh, not unlike binge watching a show, mm-hmm. you know, uh, back in the day, we had to wait for the next episode mm-hmm. a week later, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, uh, or however often the episodes were released, mm-hmm. typically a week. But, you know, uh, be, picking up a whole volume and reading six or seven issues in one or two sittings is practically the equivalent of binge watching a show yeah. whether it be netflix or uh, another streaming service or hbo whatever mm-hmm. like it's it's binge reading and so you are not going that typical month in between one issue to the next mm-hmm. I, I think it's typically a month right between issues i think so i, I was looking at it's been I, a while i don't really buy issues i buy things in volumes yeah, because I, I don't like keeping all the issues i like books <laughs> right uh, because they have a spine because they have you, a spine when yeah. you put them on a bookshelf you can and they look prettier instead yeah. of like what is this thin flimsy piece of paper that right. i'm having yeah but yeah i mean i uh i i just spent a decent amount of time on the wikipedia pages and <laughs> i happen to be looking at the release dates sponsored for by the... <laughs> wikipedia not really uh, no they are no, not no. sponsoring us no uh no we... sponsors <laughs> yeah we'll get there yeah. eventually one day one day one, 10 years from now yeah um when wikipedia it, still exists <laughs> It's a slow burn. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I, I noticed that it was a, uh, they were released about a month apart. But anyways, like I said, it, it was, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that, you know, when you say if you're the typical comic book reader where you pick up, pick this up from issue to issue, mm-hmm. you are, you have that period of time to let that information settle. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have like the issue where, um, you know, Vanya can't participate in the uh, the the battles that the Umbrella Academy are fighting, mm-hmm. and uh, and then all of a sudden you have her going to audition, and she's like, "These guys are freaks. I'm not fucking playing for you guys. You're a weir- mm-hmm. bunch of weirdos." Mm-hmm. Uh, and then she comes back when she realizes that her family definitely still sucks, and they haven't changed one bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, y- you you have time in between those issues if you're reading them in in that capacity to you have <clears throat> time to let that information settle mm-hmm. and so it's not as immediate and you're not like powering through it so you know it's the way you process that information is going to be uh, obviously a lot different than you know if you mm-hmm. let that information settle for a little bit mm-hmm. <clears throat> so like i said i just wanted to play devil's advocate to my own gripe okay. about the uh, about Vanya's... The lack of character development. Sure, yeah. But, okay, so counterpoint to that. Okay. Whether... I think whether you have, like, a time period of waiting or whether you just binge something, character development should still develop at the same pace, no matter how 
far you read it. Sure. Even if you're waiting months and months and months, it if it's in the story and if it's written well, mm-hmm. the character would have developed well. Sure. Versus like whether I watched it or read it immediately, mm-hmm. you can see it happening. You know, like. Yeah, so for her, I think it's just like those were the seeds that were planted. And then they were like, we got to get to the plot points because things are happening. Right. Because they really they really um, t- tell the story of this family very quickly in the first, first volume. Very much so. Because, I mean, yeah, the amount of information if people don't know and if we haven't summarized yet, essentially um, these kids, even once you find out that they have been... Um, adopted at 10 years old and they're like a superhero team um they are they it fast forwards to the future it just cuts to from after they finish their first battle cuts to them as adults Mm -hmm. and um they are all reunited because their father had died right and then you realize oh they disbanded they weren't successful like they disbanded a long time ago and they don't like each other right and you're like why don't they like each other and i think that's such a cool way to get people's attention and also gives you a lot of room to develop characters in the future and to make more stories because you want to know why they hate each other now why why they have these feelings strong feelings for each other what happened between um these years why aren't they together and um why does he why does space boy look like a half monkey (laughs) when he as a 10 year old child he had a normal body you know and um so so yeah that was that's really my counter argument like whether or not time like how you consume it character development should still be there um and should still be done properly and you would should still feel the same effect whether it's like a month or 10 minutes i.e also look at the last season of game of thrones <laughs> character development matters that's why sure we all i feel some type of way about it yeah, that's, I'm gonna that's, stop there because I know separate, I will go and talk about two hours about it. But that's moving a separate on. episode. Um, <laughs> I actually thought about doing a Game of Thrones episode, one on the last season, uh, when in December because that's when the the Blu-ray uh, disc set is set oh, to come out for okay. for the last season. Uh, I I mean I was I was looking for an opportunity to do an episode because even though you know without going into uh, too much yeah. last season left most people a little upset but by the time I got to the point of like being able to record episodes again it wasn't really it was over contempor- yeah it yeah. was over people had already moved on to something yeah. else they had to uh, let it go it so happen. yeah I figured um, if I if there is an opportunity to to do it yeah um that that could be it yeah we got off the titanic just in time to see it watch and sink into the bottom of the ocean <laughs> next the next the next december is when mm. we're gonna go back and find the heart of the ocean again and we would be like it's been 84 it's years. been 84 yeah. years <laughs> yeah um was uh talking about the villains a little bit let's do it i love villains mm, yes i am a sucker for a good villain yeah and I didn't think we really had decent ones up until like Dallas and um, and Hotel Oblivion. Yeah, like, I thought the the villain stuff was and that's a very technical term. Villain stuff. The villain stuff. The I villain stuff it. in Hotel Oblivion was um, hilariously incredible, mm-hmm. incredibly hilarious. Mm-hmm. Uh, either one of those. Both. Uh, so the I mean there's there's a main villain, right? There there's like uh There are many there's so many uh, in well, Hotel Oblivion. That, Which that's, one? No, that's that's what I was getting to. I okay. was trying to remember like there's I think there's a main villain you or a couple Perseus. Uh right. Uh but there's uh, but then there's um so there's Jonathan uh that that's who you're Perseus? talking about. Right? Yeah. There's John Perseus. Right, who Re, uh, unleashes all the the Word. captured villains yep. from Hotel Oblivion, yep. um, which was apparently referenced briefly in a Apop- yes. apocalypse suite, I believe. Very, very, very briefly, briefly. Yeah. literally a sentence or two. Yeah, and because I basically blew through all three of these volumes to get them back to you because mm-hmm. uh, you let me borrow Thank them, um, I 
uh, I miss that. It's okay. I mean, it. I barely missed it too. Like that's another thing. Side note. Uh, side tangent, which I do all the time. Uh, I like okay. about we, we these. Accept those here. <laughs> what I like about these, the way it's written, is that if you pay attention, like uh, there are multiple stories happening at the same time in in all of these volumes. Sure, there, there it always follows more than just one person, um, and which also kind of makes it hard for the reader sometimes to keep track of what's happening. And so that's when they plant those little seeds. There are like little clips and pictures of little seeds and plot points that come up later Mm -hmm. so for example in apocalypse suite um number five talks about the way he time travels and time travels back and then there are random like time soldiers appearing and you're like who are these people but they're never talked about it again and then you realize in the next volume who they are in volume two again in dallas John Perseus appears for like a page. Yeah. And like he's talking about his company and you're like, right. who, and I'm like, who's, who the fuck who is, is this dude? It? Why do we care? Right. Like, and I figured that he, he has some sort of important part mm-hmm. in the story, but like it was like it just it was enough. It was for, just like, like a taste. Yeah. And, and left you like wondering for the next 10 years. Yeah. Uh, what, Literally. Yeah. And you're like, oh, what is happening? And so they drop little hints. So in umbrella academy it was so clever because it was little like flashbacks essentially um the first one was a flashback where they referenced the hotel it was when i uh rumor allison number three Mm -hmm. this is gonna be long because i have to announce their titles every single time uh when she was strapped in that chair and terminal was talking to her and like bantering with her he was like before your father locks me away in that room in that place mm-hmm. uh, for forever i'm going to have my like final revenge and he's like villain monologuing or whatever right and so that's the first hint and you're like what place like is he talking about and it, it's just so small and you, it moves on and you're like okay whatever moving on and then it cuts to present day and um because one of the plot points in apocalypse suite is that uh terminal did make random robots if the the umbrella academy ever got back together to come alive um so those terminal robots came back and so they had to fight them again right and so luther number one was talking and saying like oh i thought like he couldn't escape the hotel like once you're locked in there you can't escape the hotel and that's when they reference hotel oblivion Mm. he just said the hotel he didn't say hotel oblivion right it was just like i thought once you're in the hotel you can't escape why are his robots here and then they were like it must be because it was something he did before he was placed in the hotel yeah um so i love the little like seeds that they plant ahead of time um but going back to you and the villains villain stuff um yeah, the villains have sometimes, at least in the beginning, have like been lacking. Yeah, just kind of. Felt um, that. The conductor was the main villain of the first one, which and is I I also love that idea, which is another reason why I love these books. It's just crazy, fantastical ideas of like right a conductor as a villain. What is he doing? <laughs> like his whole entire orchestra literally are thieves and murderers, right? And they love to play instruments. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, okay, sure, right? And- like, are, are you friends with like the evil version of the village people? Yeah, like- <laughs> it's just, it's just. I was just like, how? But okay, but sure. Like, do you play like? a symphony and then murder the audience is that how Precisely. we do do this <laughs> that's exactly but, what happens <laughs> uh, but I thought it was just so funny and out, so outside of the box and that's what I love um, but yeah the conductor kind of was just lacking because he was like I want to destroy the world and that's why I'm here mm-hmm. and I was like every villain wants to destroy the world and that's why they're here well for the most part you know right um, and then um I'm not sure if there was another villain you were wanting to bring up earlier uh, besides um, the conductor in volume one. Uh, no, that that was pretty much it in volume one. And then in so in volume two, uh, we I mean, we obviously had Cha Cha and Hazel. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we discussed them. But as far as main villains... Uh, or it was mainly the time agency because Dallas right. number two volume the volume number two in Dallas even the titles have like <laughs> random ass names uh, in volume two Dallas the main the main um, antagonist was the time agency mm-hmm. they were coming after number five right. because he escaped um, he forgot to tell his siblings that 
while time traveling back from the future where he saw the world being destroyed. So he went back to try to save his family and the world. Um, he got caught by a thing called the Time Agency. And I think there's a whole entire name for them and it spells out temps, which is kind of funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't remember what the exact acronym it stands for right now. But um, they essentially are a group of outliers who travel through time um, capture them and then train them to be assassins to essentially keep the balance of time right um, to take out and assassinate random people um, to make sure time doesn't go cray cray and so he eventually becomes one of those people and becomes the best one because they operate on his body and apparently put the DNA of every single killer they've ever found into him and that's why he's so precise right and with his uh, with number five's ability to like tele- t- teleport through time it made him like the ultimate killer and so eventually he got hardened and then he was like i don't want to do this anymore i need to go back to my family and so he didn't he like backstabbed them and like left and like essentially doctor who'd his way back home right (laughs) but into the body of a child instead of his 60 year old body right yeah Uh, and so they're now back to be like we needed you to finish this job we're Mm -hmm. here if you don't help us we're gonna kill basically your young self right um and your entire family and your young self and your twin your twin sibling yeah because of um which uh yeah so that one's a little bit more interesting at least Mm -hmm. that one they have a reason they have like a purpose to like get them together um but what i really noticed like even though for the most part the villains you know aren't the most compelling but at the end of the day it's not about the villains it's about the heroes and i think that's maybe why sometimes the villains aren't as compelling sure is because they're trying to tell the story of this family of this family and this yeah. these characters so the villains don't really get a main stage they sure. kind of take a little bit of a backseat they kind of are there to like yeah we have some plot points to fill they help push the story forward um they do interact with the characters and they do add character development to the characters but they're not they're not the main thing that they're trying to stop sure we're what we're trying to do is unveil each character and the layers that they have mm. and so dallas is very much about number five mm-hmm. and how yeah, he got sure. to be where he is and i mean so, he's on the front cover He's on a front cover. I mean, I love these front covers. And, um, is front the, cover redundant? I mean, front and cover? I mean, back cover. There's a back oh, cover. well, okay. Well, I'll just go fuck myself. <laughs> That's fine. No, no, no. I don't uh, mean to make you sound weird. No, but, I, I mean, I, I sound weird all on my own. Okay, great. Copy. <laughs> Me too. But, um, but I think that's essentially maybe why sometimes the villains kind of lack, are lacking in these stories. No, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, like, I feel like there is a lot of comic books and a lot of movies and shows uh, and not just ones that are, you know, a comic book to movie or show adaptation Mm -hmm. where like the the villain kind of propels the story forward Mm -hmm. uh, and the 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 heroes or the main characters there they evolve based on their villains Mm -hmm. whereas it's kind of it's not necessarily the flip of that for Mm -hmm. the umbrella academy but like you said it's you know the the progression of um the this family and new developments coming to light and the their personal actions that kind of propel the story forward Mm -hmm. so uh, again like you said it's um the need for these these great fantastic villains is not as big of a need as i don't know like a a iteration of batman (laughs) oh yeah as As thanos or like the joker yeah yeah uh so yeah i i mean that that totally makes sense in Mm -hmm. in the context of you know your your argument that yeah that's um that's that definitely makes sense yeah i mean like yeah, I mean, even the third volume, the villain there, there's so many. There are multiple villains. There are multiple storylines. There, the, I guess the main villain was John Perseus, and he didn't feel like a villain until like halfway through because you didn't even know what he was doing right. until like halfway through, and you're like, oh, 
he wants to find his father. Yeah, there was a lot. Well, apparently, he was a criminal. <laughs> right. Yeah, there was a lot up in the air. And that was another thing that I found really intriguing about Hotel Oblivion was that for like the first half, at least, there was a lot going on that you had no idea what the fuck was going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, or that could just be me because I'm stupid. No, no, no. You're um, you're totally right. Like there was uh, there was a lot uh, that I was just like, okay, like obviously think... things are going to come to fruition, mm-hmm. and all this nonsense will make sense mm-hmm. at some point in time. Mm-hmm. At least I hope that's what's going to happen because none of this really makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and, and but you know, like I said, it eventually th- uh, everything came to fruition, mm-hmm. fell into place, and I was like, oh. Now I see what's going on, yeah. and I I loved like him letting all the captured villains out. Mm-hmm. It reminded me of like it's just hilarious to me to begin with, mm-hmm. but um, it kind of reminded me. Have you ever seen Cabin in the Woods? Yes. Okay. It reminded me of all of Every, the the ending the creatures. Of <laughs> yeah, or like the scene, like specifically the scene where it's like. The wide shot of the um, the corridor with the, the elevators, elevators and, and it goes the, ding ding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like all so, the monsters just right, fly out, right, and and there's like a giant octopus mm-hmm. in there, I think, and um, it, that's exactly what it reminded me of. I mean, it's it's not anything like that, of mm-hmm. course, uh, in in the, the literal sense, um, in how things transpire, but still like. That's kind of what I thought of was mm-hmm. the hilarity of like all these villains coming out and like so you have the opportunity to see all these villains that they once battled that some of them were referenced mm-hmm. in uh, in the the preceding volumes mm-hmm. some of them weren't like you you were kind of meeting them for the first time mm-hmm. so it was I almost felt like a, a little mini like catch up of. Um, if you felt like it was the series was lacking in mm-hmm. its villains, um, at least in quantity, uh, it was it was kind of well, like here's here's an excess of villains. Yeah, and I think also it, it, I mean, speaking about the villains, especially in Hotel Oblivion, like the third volume, like um, it opens up with I think Space Boy number one trying to like beating a villain in Tokyo. Right. Yeah. Like, like, and, and so I feel like their jobs as superheroes, like have gone so far, been so successful is that the world just is filled with superheroes and they're just beating villains all the time and they're just putting them away. Mm -hmm. But specifically for the umbrella Academy, the really dangerous ones, uh, like equivalent to like Arkham Asylum in, you know, Batman's world are Mm -hmm. placed in a place called hotel oblivion. Um, right. And so, that's why the villains feel like inconsequential sometimes because they're just so they're just superheroes now and you're like okay another villain defeated moving on to the next one right. um and also talking about the the way half of that first vo- third volume felt um i think that's a, another part of the writing that gets you that's kind of clever uh, because it h- hooks you in mm-hmm. it plants all these little storylines that are happening at the same time and they're like you don't know what's happening but it's coming and so you want to keep reading because you're like i need an ending to this like why are we talking about this random spaceship why are we talking about space right why are we why are we doing this why are we um in this hotel what is happening about this hotel what is so special about this hotel um and it it's just um and by then you already care about these main characters so much that you want to keep reading right um and so i think that's very clever in the way that they write slightly frustrating as a reader sometimes but hmm, just sure. just because like you do have to keep track of those separate storylines happening at the same time um because i sometimes find myself like flipping back to be like what did they just say like where right. are we going yeah um but uh but yeah the the villain in i thought was very clever or at least i like i like it when writers um kind of allude to like mythologies and themes i i just love yeah i noticed you had something in your notes about uh, uh greek mythology yeah so you want to elaborate a little sure, bit sure like i mean before i just interrupted you just no. now it seemed like you were going to get to that yeah uh, interrupt all the way yeah no, that's just me being an a-hole so. i love it but uh so main villain i guess or an- 
uh, antagonist in this uh, third volume is named John Perseus. Mm-hmm. Um, and Perseus is a hero, actually, right. in Greek mythology. <laughs> He's kind of like Percy Jackson. <laughs> yeah, like that. Except I never read any of those books, but I did see that terrible movie. Um, uh, I also saw that movie. <laughs> I uh, I can't remember. If they it was, also, sorry, continue. No, I, I, it's just... Uh, it, it probably was terrible. Um, I just... I feel I bad really, because I don't really remember that. Side that tangent long. again for the hundredth time. I feel bad because the author of that book I know really, really, really tried to make those movies good, mm-hmm. and Hollywood was just like, "No, thank you." Yeah. And like, I remember like him putting out all the receipts on his like web page about like all the emails that, and that he sent to the writers and was like, "I really want this movie to be good. You need to change these things." please and they didn't really yeah like if you go on his website like there's an entire blog that he has that he just puts receipts on and he was just like i sent this email to them and they just didn't let me change a thing you know they 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 sent me the script and they told me like they showed it to me because i want to know and maybe get my thoughts and i sent them my thoughts about how it should be better and how to it should be closer and truer to the books in certain ways and uh, how to do that mm-hmm. but they just re- refused and so the movie came out it was a shit show <laughs> and of course nobody wanted to see it yeah again and i think they made a second one because legally they were contracted to do a second yeah. one and then they tried to buy the rights for the third book and it's like no 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 no, we're not doing this right um and another side note to that side note um side note a <laughs> um there's actually a musical there's like the lightning thief is a musical if you didn't know that i i did not so know that. fun fact go and find it somewhere okay. um there is a lightning thief musical i think it might be decent i don't know i've never seen it because it's a musical and you might have to be in broadway or on broadway to see it sure but going back to the main topic the villain of volume three john perseus uh perseus is a, is a greek hero mm-hmm. um i don't know like my mythology that in depth but the s- gist of it of what i remember is that perseus um is a greek hero that essentially um i think he saves a city like there's a city that's under siege and they always have to like give sacrifices to like the sea monster that comes or something like sure. that and i think andromeda is the princess that was like placed there and like at some point in this like long ass odyssey um he goes and he kills medusa Perseus is the one that does it, not Hercules. Um, so he cuts off the head of Medusa, and as the monster is trying to devour the city, he brings up Medusa, and Medusa freezes the monster with her Medusa powers of like turning people into stone. Um, so I thought that was v- kind of clever that they kind of injected that into this story, sure. because um, Medusa in this story is this kind of like AI robot head that looks like Medusa in greek mythology that Mm -hmm. like his father created right um that corrupted his father and um i thought it was so clever especially when you look at it in the panels eventually he frees all the villains in hotel oblivion teams up with medusa and he puts on this like greek like this armor high-tech armor but it looks greek Mm -hmm. and roman and he has like this flaming sword on his hand and medusa is like attached to his arm and like it the, almost looks like the like a gauntlet yeah like and from, uh, that's kind of like how thanos is uh yeah gauntlet. yeah and like also referencing to um greek mythology like that's kind of what he did he right. had medusa's hand head in his hand like left hand and yeah. a sword in his right right so and i thought i was just her head as a weapon exactly basically. Yeah. that's how he defeated like the huge monster which is essentially kind of how they defeated the main monster in um, hotel oblivion because mm-hmm. um one of the villains that got out again referencing to little seeds that they plant was dr terminal right and he just feeds and feeds and feeds and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and is like about to swallow the city whole and the only way to destroy him apparently medusa is has like a nuclear reactor in her mm-hmm. head i guess all this fits like so well yes. in, within the <laughs> confines of the ridiculous yes like uh, you just accept it because by then you're like well there's like you're, a you're giant space in. monster that yeah if, if you've read up until this point then you have invested in, yeah in the you're just like line. sure why not let's move on right. like at this point nothing surprises me um so um luther number one 
uh, takes Medusa's head and like throws it into Terminal, and that's what kills him and right. stops the city from being burned up. But I also thought it was very poetic that um, the way Medusa was freed from, you know, uh, Perseus was that Perseus had to cut off because she had latched his her tendrils into his arm so he couldn't let go of that gauntlet in mm, his left hand. Yeah. He literally had to cut off the head of Medusa just like in Roman okay. uh, Greek mythology. Mm. So I was like, oh, it's a nice little twist. Sure. is And the fact that he actually teamed up with Medusa at the same time but also still followed like, the link to Greek mythology of cutting off the head of Medusa okay. to defeat her and then using Medusa's head to literally defeat a giant monster <laughs> that's trying to kill the city. I'm so glad that um, you picked up on all these little nuances from Greek mythology mythology uh because i didn't really pick up on. i any of that. just love mythology a lot also side note kind of side note the ship that they fly the minerva uh-huh. that's also mythology yeah i i knew um, i knew minerva from that that that's a a name from mythology i knew yeah. that much but um you know basically everything that you just said uh, yeah. was like uh what um the the perseus name sounded very familiar i was like i, I feel like i i could google this name and I mean, figure out why it seems so familiar but like i said i, I wanted it, to power through it it might seem familiar mainly because like hollywood did a thing about it a while, like a couple years ago, mm-hmm. uh, I think called like Clash of the Titans or something like that. It's sure. actually Greek mythology, and it's about Perseus. And they did a, the whole bit about Perseus killing Medusa. Okay, you know, um, so that's why some people might know about it. Okay, um, but but yeah, Minerva Minerva is the little spaceship that they fly into like the after space and and whatnot, and she is the Roman equivalent of Athena. And if you're talking about, like, Greek mythology and the Odyssey, Athena comes to Odysseus Mm -hmm. and, like, aids him in his voyage on the ship because she's the goddess of wisdom and war. So I thought that was also kind of very, like, appropriate to have a spaceship flying through space aiding you to guide you in your Odyssey and journey of space and also using it as a way of, like, fighting war, too, because they tried to, like, use the ship to defeat the monster later so right little just like i love little hints like mythologies and other references yeah um and i thought that was very 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 clever of them um yeah yeah that was neat um well uh do you want to uh do you want to finally get into the 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 netflix uh comparison stuff um i think so i don't know if i have like I have anything else to say since our note this is like the very first time that I've printed out notes for those of you listening so uh, the reason why I you hear paper one is because that I mean I printed out my notes and two like my I didn't realize that my printer did both front and back uh, kind of like a laser printer would so um, I feel like my notes are all... I have uh, uh, okay, here we a go. little bit. Yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about this like after... Um, I don't know if you want to talk about this after we compare or now. It's just a few questions I had after reading Hotel Oblivion like, okay. about certain things, but we can... Let's go with that. After? No. Right now? now? Okay, cool. Right cool, now. Cool. Let's do it. So, a few questions. Um... So in Hotel Oblivion, one of the questions I had was um, the purpose of there's like a, a entity called Scientific Man that was looked like he was play, being guard like being a guard right. for Hotel Oblivion mm-hmm. on on this planet. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Hotel Oblivion is placed on like some weird planet far in space in like limbo that you can't barely find. Right. Um. And and um. The father of the Umbrella Academy. Academy built that hotel for all. it's the Azkaban right of yeah this world. Um, if you don't know Harry Potter, sorry, good luck. <laughs> right. Um, so they as they get there, all of these characters find their way there somehow. Most of them, mm-hmm. most of the heroes find their way there. Um, and Luther gets there, and and they realize all the the villains are loose, and they're like, oh no, where does it go to? It's going back to Earth. It's going back to our city. Um, then they 
experience this weird Cthulhu like monster of space. Right. For like a split second. Like this is another seed I feel like that might be coming back later in a, maybe like a volume four. Sure. But it's just like it looks like Cthulhu, but you can't tell because it's all space like. Mm-hmm. But it does have like an like a weird tentacles and like an eye at the end of the tentacle that goes all the way down and touches the forehead of Luther. And there was like this shot, like screenshots of like right. little shots of like him as a baby. And then you're like, what is this? And then it disappears. It just flies off into space. And he was like, what the hell is that? And um, the friend that they were with, the friend of um, their father's, was like, uh, or somebody mentioned that they didn't think the hotel was actually a prison Mm -hmm. for criminals. It was actually a cosmic trap. And and that's all they said. They was like, it's not a prison, it's a cosmic trap. And I was like, what? does that mean where you and then they said the bait is gone now so essentially the prisoners were bait for some type of cosmic trap um so i think that was just one of my big questions like what is that giant creature probably will come back later but like what's the purpose was science scientific man who was standing outside of the hotel seemed like he was the guardian of that place and was super super strong and could take down anything was he maybe the purpose to defeat that like Cthulhu like monster hmm. because yeah, he was maybe. the only one that was not locked in the prison. He was the only one outside. And he, sure. scientific man has a very like strong code of ethics of saying like, I'm going to purify this world. Humans are like the disgrace of blah, blah, blah. And, like, right. I want to destroy anything that is not like pure. Yeah. Right. You, yeah. You kind of get the impression first that he's, he's on the, the good side but then he starts that crazy talk and you're like this dude is off his rocker yeah. like he wants to end like he's fucking too everything. pure <laughs> yeah like, yeah he's like he's uh like if someone purified a brita pitcher um <laughs> and sure. like the brita pitcher like committed suicide by jumping like, off the counter the brita pitcher is so pure that it melts the brita itself i don't right, know yes that's probably not how pure it is itself. <laughs> that's acidity but whatever right um, um also, uh, is there uh, does, is there like another Umbrella Academy? Like because yeah, there's, there's so, uh, I I mean I totally for, like this this was the cliffhanger. Yeah. like there's there's another uh, there's other so, versions of themselves yeah. or something. The other plot points that uh, that brings up some of my other questions too. Like who the fuck are these guys? Who are they? Because. Um, so, are they the, some of the rest of the 40? I assume that they might be some of the rest of the 40, um, mainly because um, Vanya was taken to them after uh-huh. she spoke to this man who was apparently friends with the Umbrella Academy's mom, who's actually a robot. Right. Um, and I don't know. She's like, he's he she she's vanya said like he grilled her for about 20 minutes about who she was Mm -hmm. and then the mom took her to paris and was like i'm here to help you walk like the mom really wants to rehabilitate vanya because she she relates to vanya in the fact that she is only looked as an object and has been rejected because the father never loved her the father just made her to try to be a mom right because he is an alien doesn't understand human emotions Mm -hmm. so um, so she tried to make her walk and she's like, I can't. But then this other girl suddenly comes up and she's like, I don't believe you. And she starts walking. And so I think the, this, and she has this little symbol on her uniform that is like a bird. Yeah. It's, it's just a, a small little bird on a branch. Right. And she's like, follow me. I, I'm taking you somewhere important. I'm taking you home. Yeah. And you're like, home, what does that mean? And, right. And yeah. Vanya is a very Russian name. So like, okay, maybe she literally means home, like to Russia, you know, to right. to Europe. Yeah. And, and here they are trekking through Trekking the through snow. Europe. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, maybe she is going home. But then they, it reveals that, hey, there's a whole entire team of other people that kind of a superhero team that is the Umbrella Academy that seems to be almost like a weird foil. Because when they appear, the Umbrella Academy is losing the battle to save the city because there are too many villains Mm -hmm. fighting and they're all fighting each other and they've been beaten up. But this other team appears suddenly and appears to have almost the same abilities, almost, I say. um, Except with like matching uniforms. Except they have matching uniforms and they appear to be put together real well right. like this family like they're a functional, like they're family, a functional family and so like that's why i think they might be a foil because um 
the girl who who told Vanya, I don't believe you, that you can't walk, feels very similar in power to maybe the rumor mm-hmm. because it's through, sure. through voice and through speaking. I picked up uh, on that as well. And yeah. then um, the number one of this new team, this bird team, they didn't give them a name. I'm just kind of going to call them the bird team. I'll accept that. The bird <laughs> academy, let's say. Um uh swallow academy i don't the know what Mocking birds Jays. are the the hunger game academy um God. so the number one is a very like thin but also very strong and chiseled like all right kind of looks hero. like Mr. incredible almost yeah and he kind of has the same like f- power of like flight and strength as the leader of mm-hmm. the umbrella academy right um and then you have this like other member that looks very pale and kind of gothic like seance and that spits like like weird rays of darkness or something from its face and then there's another one that apparently turns to crows um and then there's one that is just literally a blubbering mass of flesh that is like a human voodoo doll right like he stabbed himself and all the other people hurt themselves yeah when he, where he stabbed himself so it was really interesting like who are these people why are they here what are they trying to do um, I can only assume that it'll be elaborated on in, yeah, I mean, in, that's, in the next volume. That's the point, I guess. And also, like, um, one more person I was wondering who um, it was, was a random character that got introduced that looks very much like Hargreaves, their father, mm-hmm. but is Southern. And, like, also want, he, he contacted like the government and was just like, we need to get this thing together. Right, yeah. And he's just this like southern gentleman that apparently has a laser pistol on his wall and like gi- rides a giant like rooster. Chick- a rooster, yeah. Yeah, yeah which uh, is also very like, um, I don't know if they're trying to like throw a link to Final Fantasy, like the uh, video game. Yeah, yeah I don't But know. there's like a, uh, in Final Fantasy the video game, there's a thing called a chocobo, which is like a giant chicken bird okay. that you just like sit and you ride around uh, and it takes you places so i was just like is this like a throwback to some game reference that i don't know I but i just maybe? assumed that it we were supposed to assume that it fit in this fantastical world you could i guess look at it as this dude has a big cock sure yeah i mean it works both ways like both yes. literally and like metaphorically right like um, we we don't we have very limited information so all we can do is speculate and i'm choosing to believe that we're supposed to think that this dude has a big cock yeah i mean uh, so he seems to be very boastful anyways yeah right. but those were just like some questions that i had it was just like what were they trying to keep in there's been this prophecy of like they're here to save the world sure and like their city has been literally destroyed almost three times now like Vanya, right. Vanya almost destroyed in the first one. The second one, it was blown up, but then fixed w- through the time loop. And then now the third one, Terminal, almost eats the whole city. So I thought it was very, um, I don't know, poetic or like appropriate that in each book, <laughs> it's kind of like Metropolis. It's always getting destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> every single time. But it's this weird kind of prophecy of like, oh, they're here to save the world, but like is this the time? Is this the time? Because Luther has always been the one to like be so paranoid about that. He's like, I need to, I need to protect the world. At some point it's going to come. I I need to be prepared. Mm -hmm. Um, So I thought that might be interesting, like an interesting literary device that they keep like looping in um, into the stories of these volumes. Yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, that was, those were the main questions that I had right after, right after reading volume three. Um, we can go to comparing the things now if you want to sure. do that. Yeah, I mean we've we've uh, we've gone on uh, about the the graphic novels for uh, about an hour and thirty five minutes or so now. Wow, I've talked um, a lot. No, I mean <laughs> both of us equally. Yeah.